In a previous episode, we looked at the diet of a medieval peasant. However, if this wasn't quite to your taste, then you can join us today whilst we look at the food of the upper classes of the Middle Ages. Welcome to Medieval Madness. For the people of the Middle Ages, everything was just about rank. That's rank as in status, not disgusting. Even the type of food that the nobility ate was regarded as a status symbol. The gap between the social classes and their foodstuffs was incomparable. A person's place in society dictated what they ate, so the diets of peasants, artisans and merchants were greatly different from the meals of the ruling classes. Always at the centre of medieval life was the Catholic Church, and it strictly enforced fasting days when meat could not be eaten. Eating meat was associated with carnal desires, and an overinterest in promiscuity. So all kinds of fish were eaten on feast days such as bream, eel, salmon and cod. Pike was extremely expensive and was served only on special occasions. Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays and sometimes Saturdays were fast days. Later, fish was allowed on these days, as was fruit, bread and vegetables. Lent was particularly hard with fasting, lasting for 40 days with no meat, eggs or dairy. So even the wealthiest people did not normally eat meat every day. In fact, fast days accounted for half the days of the year. In the early Middle Ages, Pope Gregory I railed against the sin of gluttony, describing it as, quote, eating between meals, seeking out delicacies to satisfy the vile sense of taste, looking for sauces and seasonings to excite the palate, and eating more than was necessary. With the rise of the middle classes during the 12th century, sumptuary laws were enacted to control the spending of the new rich. Philippe IV of France banned his subjects from having any more than one main dish and one side dish per meal. And in England from 1363, those of lower rank were only allowed one meal of meat or fish a day. Sugar and Spice Known as sweet salt, sugar was introduced to Europe when the Crusaders returned from the Holy Lands. Its cultivation spread, and in the 1300s, Venice set up estates at some villages in Tyre for sugar production and exports to the rest of Europe. As well as using the common herbs such as parsley, sage and thyme, the upper classes had spices imported from Africa and Asia, as these were also a symbol of affluence. Cinnamon, pepper, saffron, nutmeg, ginger and other exotic spices were used extensively in food preparation, but they were also passed around at banquets on a spice platter. Guests were encouraged to take additional spice from the platter to sprinkle over their food. Spices were also added to wines and were so highly valued that they were given as gifts. During the late Middle Ages, about 1,000 tons of spice and 1,000 tons of pepper were imported into Western Europe every year. The money spent would have fed 1.5 million people with grain for a year. There actually was a special section in the royal kitchens called a spicery, which was completely dedicated to the art. In fact, one of the most important places in a medieval house were the kitchens for the management, storage and preparation of food. There would have been a buttery, pantry, cellar and larder, as well as a confectionery and a sorcery. Spicy sauces were very popular, such as the recipe for cameline sauce, which was invented by the French cook Taylevent. It included red burgundy wine, vinegar, cinnamon, ginger and other assorted spices. Taylevent included this recipe in his famous cookbook La Viandia, which he wrote at the end of the medieval period. He was the cook for several kings of France, as well as the Duke of Normandy during the 1400s. Banquets The competition between household hierarchies and the status of the guests was easily seen here. The most important people, including the lord or baron, would sit at one end of the room on a raised platform. They would be seated at a table side by side, facing the other guests who would sit on chairs and stools at trestle tables further down the hall. Salt was rare and expensive. It would be placed at the centre of the high table, as only those important enough were allowed to use it. The container or salt cellar, often called a nef, which was used to hold the condiment, would be highly decorative, sometimes in the shape of a ship to reflect the importance that salt was given. Those on the lower tables were said to be sitting below the salt. The prestige of the host would be judged by the exclusivity and quantity of the food provided. 
While the order that the diners were served in, and both the amount and rarity of the food served to them also showed their social rank. Those lower in the status were given less of the finer quality ingredients and smaller quantities. The Lord would always be served first, and there were courtesy books that laid down the rules for proper conduct when eating at the table. One such book, printed by William Caxton in the 15th century, states that one should, quote, speak little, not burp or fart, or pare your nails, or pick your teeth at the table, or lean on it, amongst other things. Hands were washed before the meal, and because the host was not required to provide knives, guests often brought their own. In the 11th century, the Italian nobleman Domenico Selvo brought his Greek wife back to Central Europe. Her use of a fork for eating was regarded as scandalous and heretical. The squires of the kitchen had the job of choosing, purchasing, and paying for the food provisions. The dishes for the feast would be made by the cooks in the kitchen, in the most elite households there was usually more than one cook, and then placed on dresses by the squires until it was time for service in the Great Hall. The dishes were served on plates made from pewter or gold and silver in the finest of households. There could be anything up to six courses, and the meal would begin with bread, which was always served with every meal. A nobleman would have eaten white bread, made every day in his own kitchen, rather than the rough brown rye bread eaten by the peasantry. The more prominent the household was, then the finer and whiter the bread would be. Some elite households may even have had their own mill and produced their own flour. Only nobles were allowed to hunt game and fish on their estates, so there would be a variety of freshly killed game meat for the tables such as wild boar, venison, hares and rabbits, or wild fowl like pheasant and partridge, as well as the more domesticated animals such as chickens, geese, pigs and duck. Many types of bird were roasted and eaten such as quail, cranes and larks, and other songbirds depending on the season. But swans and storks were only eaten by the elite, although they were usually displayed as a lavish centerpiece rather than eaten for their meat. Vegetables would have also been seasonal and probably picked from the Lord's own garden. Cabbage and leeks were popular, but parsnips, peas, carrots, turnips, onions, broad beans and various squashes would also have been available. Many estates would have orchards providing fresh produce such as apples, pears and plums. Raw fruit and vegetables were thought to cause disease, so they were always served cooked. Expensive dried fruits and nuts would also make it to the nobles' table. Raisins, figs, dates and almonds were highly sought after in Central and Northern Europe and imported, as were Mediterranean fruits such as oranges and grapes. The Royal Appetite the feasts held for members of the royalty were, of course, extremely lavish affairs. The coronation banquet of Henry IV is said to have consisted of three courses. But it should be noted that courses in the Middle Ages were not served like they are today with a starter, main, and dessert. Dishes that were brought out to the guests were a random assortment and only consistent in that they offered a great deal of choice. The food was meant to be a form of entertainment in itself, with enough variety so that the guests could pick and choose whatever they liked and discount some dishes entirely. There would be an interval of music or some sort of performance between each course, and each one that was presented came with a sugar sculpture known as a subtlety, which was completely decorative. Each carving was made to represent some form of religious symbolism, such as an angel or a saint. Only those of great wealth could afford to use sugar in this way, for looking at rather than eating. At a 1387 feast held by the Duke of Lancaster and Richard II, the quantities of food including, among other things, 111 swans, 210 geese, 96 rabbits, 160 pounds of apples, and 12,000 eggs. The Count of Anjou, who was the third son of King Louis II of Sicily, held a great banquet in 1455. The first course was a stag that had been salted overnight, and a quarter of it was served with stuffed chicken, loin of veal, and jugged hare cooked in red wine, spices, and fresh herbs. Two dishes were smothered in a German sauce, and had pomegranate seeds and sugar plums which were covered in gold leaf. Three further courses consisted of a roe deer, a sturgeon braised in vinegar and parsley and dusted with powdered ginger and a whole pig, chickens and pigeons, a dozen of each, six baby rabbits and a baby goat, two goslings, a stuffed capon, two herons and a leveret, four chickens were smothered in egg yolks then dusted with spice, and a wild boar was covered with wafers and stars, and a partridge in a pear tree. This was followed by a cream sprinkled with sugar and fennel seeds. Slices of cheese, strawberries, and a red and white jelly, which represented the crests of the attending guests. Finally, there were plums soaked in rose water. 
The fifth and final course comprised entirely of fashionable wines and preserves made from fruit, as well as numerous types of sweet pastries. Of course, other drinks such as ale or mead were available, but wine was chosen by the medieval nobility because it created a division between them and the lower classes, giving them the appearance of sophistication. Wine was also thought to keep the humours in balance, lift the spirit and aid both digestion and the colour of the complexion. Obviously, Henry would have wanted to serve a beverage that was held in great esteem and displayed his wealth. There was always some sort of theatrical showpiece at a high-ranking banquet, and this one was no exception. The centrepiece represented a green garden and was surrounded by branches and peacock feathers. Aromatic flowers were tied to the branches. A silver-gilded mini-fortress was placed in the middle of the lawn, which acted as a large cage for several live birds with gilt feet. On each corner of the lawn was a huge pie topped with smaller pies to form the shape of a crown. The pies were gilded in silver and gold, naturally, and they also contained a whole row deer, chickens, pigeons, rabbits, minced veal, two pounds of fat, and 26 boiled eggs sprinkled with saffron and studded with cloves. It's no surprise then that obesity was very common amongst the nobility of the Middle Ages, with many consuming four to 5,000 calories a day more than double what was actually needed. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Do you hope you enjoyed it and that it hasn't made you too hungry? Please do subscribe if you like the content and we'll see you next week for another video. Cheers.